Okay, let's start. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this presentation about uh, better performances with HTTP2 and Eclipse Vertex. Thank you for coming. There is um, a lot of good choices uh, here at the conference. It's my first time, but I've seen that the, the program is uh, very, um, you know, um, just great. So thank you for joining me. And um, this presentation was started as we integrated the HTTP2 protocol into our HTTP client and HTTP server uh, stacks in the Vertex project. Um, so as we were doing it, we, were, we really wanted to know if the promises of better performances will, would be there. So we, we started by looking at what HTTP2 was uh, on the client side. And then we wanted to know if those benefits that were expected for the, the web, we could have it as well inside the data center. So this talk is going to be divided in two parts. In the first part, we will see how HTTP2 will improve web performance by looking at some um, uh, um, examples. And in the second part, uh, I will um, uh, explain to you what the, the benchmark uh, we, uh, we, we used and, um, and the results and how different server architectures uh, can um, profit uh, from the HTTP2 improvements. Okay, uh, before we start, uh, I am Thomas Segismont. I live in France, in Marseille. I work uh, for Red Hat since 2012, so um, my day job basically is to be paid to contribute to open source, so that's cool. <laughs> um, uh, before I joined the Vertex team uh, in August 2016, I was working for the Ocular project, which is a time series database. Uh, but that's it for me. If you have any questions uh, after the talk, and uh, we cannot address all of them, uh, you can ping me um, on GitHub, Gmail, Freenode, Twitter, wherever. I always use the same nickname. So let's go. Um, how can we improve web performance with HTTP2? Who knows what this is? Any idea? Yeah? No, this, 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 exactly this. The first page. The first page ever, yeah. Created at CERN like 25 years ago. And what's cool with this page, it's, it's just HTML. It's self-describing that uh, all the text, all the information, uh, whether you have a link, etc., it's all inside the same content. It's very small. It's like um, four kilobytes. If you even compress it, you can take it down to one kilobyte. And so on modern uh, networks, it could uh, even um, travel inside just uh, one uh, uh, TCP segment. So it's pretty cool. But the bad news is the web pages from today, they are not like this. You know, it's very common today that we have like dozens of uh, JavaScript files, CSS files, uh, even videos, etc. So the way the protocol was created in the beginning for simple HTML pages uh, is not good with the web pages from today. Um, so you may wonder, how did we improve on this? Um, and so the first reaction could be that having better bandwidth is better to get a better uh, 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 latency, uh, better response time, sorry. But it's not the case. Um, in the, well, in the beginning, if you have a, a better bandwidth on your network, it's, it's getting better. But the um, page load time for your web pages doesn't get any better as soon as you, you cross a, a small megabytes uh, per second. And then you don't even have uh, anything for the, for the additional megabytes. But if you change the latency, that is the round trip time between your server and the client, then the gains are much bigger. And you see that every, every uh, um, round-trip type improvement will improve the page uh, load time. And the reason is that there is um, an impedance mismatch between HTTP 1 and the TCP protocol. So the TCP protocol is a, a connected protocol. And 
the way it works, when you establish a connection first, the client will send a packet to the server. So you have a first packet which travels to the server, and the server has to reply to, to, this, uh, to, to this packet. So it's another packet travels back, so it's already two packets around the network. And then the client also has to reply again to say, yeah, yeah, I received the acknowledgement. So that it travels again. So this is the freeware edge check. So before you can set anything, act, you know, actual uh, useful content on the, on the network, you already have three packets traveling like this for, for, for basically no, no content. And then TCP is connected and, and as a con congestion control uh, uh, mechanism. That is, you don't want to um, overwhelm the clients if he, if he cannot uh, keep up with the pace of your, uh, of your data. So what you do in the beginning is that the, the, the sender is not allowed to send as many packets uh, as he wants. So there is this uh, mechanism called the slow start, which is send me first just one packet, and then you will be able to send two packets, and then three, uh, sorry, and then four, etc. And after some times, this goes, of course, uh, uh, um, very, uh, uh, very fast up to a lot of packets. And of course, at some point, what do you start to have? Losing packets, because it's too many packets sent. So at this time, the two parties go slower again, and then they slowly increase the congestion windows. The congestion window is the number of packets which are allowed to travel on the network uh, uh, unacknowledged, okay? And this is, so this is a really long process. The, the protocol is optimized for long-lived connection. You, you don't want to create new connection over and over again. But if you think about it, uh, the websites, the way they, they uh, request data, it's by cr um, sending um, um, uh, requests in sequence. So that doesn't work really well. But still, we have per um, performing websites today. So how do they uh, do that? Uh, well, the first improvement was in the HTTP 1.1, where you get uh, persistent connections, so you could reuse uh, the, the previous connection and then, um, um, you know, make benefit from the fact that the connection is uh, already um, long-lived. Uh, another way to improve is to uh, create multiple connections, since uh, we have to wait for, our, for our, the response if we create multiple connections we can ask for different, uh, different content at the same time. But there is a limit to that because browsers, they don't create as many connections as they want. Basically, they create six connections per, um, per host. Uh, that's you know, very um, em empirical. Um, so people start, started to do domain sharding. That is, if, if I cannot have more than six uh, uh, connections per host, then I'll, I will spread my content around different hosts. And so I can get even more than six connections. Um, there's another way to improve the, the, the efficiency is to use a, a content deliver, delivery network. And the reason is that if you push the content um, closer to the client, then the distance to travel for the light is much, is much, um, is much uh, shorter. And uh, the shorter um, means um, faster, of course. Um, then there is no packet uh, which travels faster than a packet which is not being sent. So if you use browser caching and don't request um, the same content over and over again, then you get also improved uh, uh, page load time. Uh, and another way to, to, to get uh, you know, even better performance, you can um, compress, minify, and, uh, and concatenate uh, all your web resources. So instead of having those um, uh, very small requests, you send as much as possible. And again, if you use a, 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 a long file instead of very, uh, a, a lot of very small files, then you make use of this um, long-lived optimization. Right, any questions so far? Okay. So they're, they're still in a bottleneck in this protocol because as we said, we, we still have to wait for a response before we are able to to um, uh, send another request. So 
you saw all the optimization techniques and who imp who implemented things like that uh, in in their projects you know concatenation cdns who used that in the, in this uh, in their project right is it fun <laughs> is it easy no it's not it's really not so the idea of http2 is we could get rid of all this uh, this stuff and 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 um, and try to think of a new version of a protocol so that better fits the web. So um, the idea is not to you know like change everything. So we keep the same semantics. We still have get request, post request. We still have headers. Uh, we still have um, a path for the resources. Um, but we really want to focus on the way the data travels uh, on the wire. So there are two uh, RFCs which describe the protocol. The first one is the um, uh, hypertext protocol version two, of course. And the other one is the header comprehension uh, mechanism. Uh, and we will uh, come back to that in a, in a few seconds. There, there are two ways to establish an HTTP2 connection. The first one is, um, and it's the, with the one which is man mandatory on the web is to use a, a secured connection so on top of uh, uh, transport layer security. Um, if you think about it, you need uh, to, when you establish a uh, secure connection, you don't know uh, which protocol you are going to, um, to, um, um, uh, to talk with with the, the remote peer. So you need an, an extension to the protocol to negotiate if you are going to talk HTTP 1 or 2. So this is why we need the LAPN extension. Um, and the other way to establish an HTTP 2 connection is uh, HTTP 2 clear. So this, you can do it uh, inside your data center. Uh, you just send HTTP 2 pack packets right away. Or uh, you create first an HTTP 1 uh, request and you had the upgrade um, um, uh, keyword so that the connection is transformed into an HTTP2 uh, uh, connection, okay? The HTTP2 protocol is a frame protocol. Uh, so we have binary encoded frames instead of sending text data, which is much bigger. Uh, and um, they are uh, sent over um, a single connection. And there are different set of frames. Um, we, we are not going to see in details every, every frame that is uh, available in the protocol. We are just going to focus on uh, three of them which are, which are um, important to know and, and relevant. Uh, the first one is a settings frame. So the settings frame is the first that is exchanged between the client and the server. It's when they exchange those, uh, those frames that they decide how many co uh, concurrent uh, channels that they are going to use uh, inside the same connection. They also um, uh, decide uh, the size of the frames, etc. And after that, the client can start sending uh, request headers. So here you have basically an HTTP2, uh, no, sorry, an HTTP1 uh, request here on the left. So you see the method, the path, uh, the HTTP uh, version then the host and uh, a bunch of headers. And you have exactly the same in HTTP2. So the, the frame in the beginning uh, indicates its length. And then you have a type. So this is the, the, the code for a, a header frame. Then you have some flags and a stream ID. Because you need a stream ID because since it's um, uh, uh, multiplex, you need to, to be able to find which frame belongs to, to which channel. Okay. Uh, and if you look at the image, it's not really well done because it looks bigger, but actually <laughs> on the wire, it's, it's twice as smaller, <laughs> okay? Um, and what's nice with the HTTP2 uh, uh, header protocol is that we don't send over and over again the headers which don't change. If you open a browser, the browser is going to send the, its browser name and characteristics over and over again with, with HTTP 1. With HTTP 2, these things, they just disappear. They are not sent anymore, OK? So it's not only um, the fact that we have binary frames and a multiplex. There is also some, you know, it's, um, 
it's also smarter on the way that the, the HTTP uh, requests are sent uh, one after the other. After the request has been, uh, has been received, the server will reply with, uh, with um, uh, response headers and data. So again, it's the same. We, we, we have an HTTP, two, an HTTP 1 response here and the equivalent uh, in HTTP 2. In HTTP 2. Um, so again, it's bigger on the screen, but on the wire, it's, uh, it's much smaller. Um, I would like to show you uh, a demo, which is very nice because it's uh, somebody in our community who wrote it. Who wrote it. It's um, basically it's a server uh, running on my laptop and serving um, serving this uh, bridge emails in tiles, different tiles. What we are going to do is look at how this uh, image is loaded when we use HTTP 1.1 and HTTP 2, and we are going to change the latency of the server. Of course, it's on my laptop, so there is no latency. So the server is simulating it, um, and uh, when you click on, this, uh, on one of these links, it sends the corresponding latency to the server, which then just, you know, send it later, okay? So let's see what it does. We will start with um, zero latency. Oh, one thing which is important to note here is that um, uh, caching is disabled. So there is no, you know, caching tricks here. Uh, all the images are sent with the appropriate headers so that the browser doesn't cache anything. Okay? And if you compare to HTTP2, okay, then you first you have to say that you are, you agree to, <laughs> to go to unsecure HTTPS, okay? Um, if you look, there's no real big difference, right? It's not very impressive. But if you try with 60 milliseconds latency, then you start to feel the difference, okay? And then if you go to even 100 milliseconds latency, the difference is even more obvious, okay? Any questions so far? No? Okay. How many, how many connections do the server allow on this? Because you told on this that the, the first interaction is to define the max number of channels you yeah. can open. Yeah. So the, the, for HTTP 1, it's uh, six connection. Okay. For HTTP 2, I think it's, uh, it's, it's like uh, uh, 20, uh, 20 concurrent channels. Okay. But, but the important thing is not how many of, the, I mean, we could force the server to use six concurrent channels and still see some benefits. And the reason is the subsequent, uh, uh, um, um, the, I mean, the consecutive uh, aspect of HTTP 1. Because in, with HTTP 1, you still have to, uh, to wait for the server to send one tile before the client can send another one. Okay? Even with six, you can parallelize the um, yeah. Site in, in yeah, you can do order. you can do pipelining if, if that's what you what you are talking about. But pipelining has its limits. In particular, uh, if you if you if one of the requests fails, then you have to fail all the f the subsequent requests. So it's not really great. Okay. All right. So we have seen that uh, on the client side. Um, uh, HTTP 2, it, there's, no, there's no doubt it will bring some uh, great improvements. But we have seen that what, what is the key point is the latency. And if you think about it, when we are inside the data center, do we have the same problem? Yes, no? Who thinks we have the same problem? Nobody. Okay, yeah. The reason, <laughs> good. <laughs> the reason is that inside the data center, the, the networks, they are pretty good, right? It's really not the same as uh, when you're at home and, and talking to Google, right? Uh, you, you don't have, uh, and if you live uh, at the countryside uh, like some do, then it's even worse. <laughs> okay, so, um, so what we have to, um, uh, to, uh, to think about is the new kind of archi architectures we are using today. 
Um, I won't ask if anybody has heard about uh, microservices, huh? okay? Uh, but even if you don't do microservices with uh, uh, circuit breakers and service discovery and whatnot, um, I'm pretty sure that even people who do regular Java or, or I don't know which language uh, um, um, uh, business applications, their application is no longer talking only to a database. It's probably talking to one or two other services. Even if it's not microservices, it's still two or three applications which we are talking with. Okay, and and then behind that we have backends. It could be a cache, it could be a, a database, or even it could be a remote service from uh, uh, from another business unit in your company or or some other company. Okay. Um, so the constraints which we have in the data center, we have very very uh, um, uh, small um, round trip times, so like um, a millisecond. Uh, the bandwidth can be very, very good. Uh, and the service time which we used in the benchmark is um, something which has to go between one millisecond if you eat a cache and just uh, reply, or if you go to a database and query some results, then you probably have um, a, a response times around um, you know, a few hundred uh, milliseconds. And the payload site that we used um, is not too big because usually what you do with HTTP, with HTTP is like uh, sending a JSON array with, uh, with a few JSON objects inside, probably. So um, nothing really big like a video or something like that. Uh, and what we, are, we have done is that we compared for this use case, so there's a client sending a request to a server, and this server uh, uh, in turn will um, um, send another HTTP request to a backend, and we have used uh, 20 milliseconds think time for that backend. Um, so these are the results for uh, the, this benchmark. As you can see, starting uh, from uh, 400 requests per second, uh, you see some kind of plateau here. And the reason is the way the benchmark is built. If he cannot make the request in time, then it just cancels the, the, the request. So instead of having something, you know, which starts to have bad response times, it just cancels the request, and that's why you see, and you see this uh, plateau. And the result here, 400, it's uh, pretty, um, uh, pretty logic. We have uh, 20 milliseconds uh, think time on the back end, and we have uh, eight uh, uh, parallel collection. If you do the math, then uh, after um, uh, uh, 400 uh, requests per second, you cannot do uh, any more, okay? So the limitation here, again, is that any time we make a request, we have first a get request from the client to the server, at this time, we cannot answer yet. We have to send a, a GET request to the backend. After 20 milliseconds, the backend will reply with the response, and only then we'll be able to send uh, the, the, the 200 uh, response, and only then the client will be able to send the next run, okay? So now, if we try that with a, uh, HTTP 2, we have um, much better results. Um, so this is with um, uh, blocking thread pool based uh, uh, applications, something like Tomcat or, or, or Spring, if you want. Okay, and we wanted to to uh, um, to see how why it get better. So here, what happens uh, is that thanks to the multiplexing, the client is able to send on the same co uh, same connections multiple requests at the same time. Then the server uh, goes to the back end, and after 20 milliseconds, they are all replied uh, at the same time. So that's why you see many more requests per second. So that's already an improvement. But if you think about it, this, um, this thread pool concurrency does not really fit well with the protocol. Because on the wire, you now have multiplexed uh, requests on the same wire, but on the server side, it's still uh, worker threads. And so how does a worker thread work? It will pick one of the tasks, request uh, uh, um, um, the, the data from the backend, and only 
when the thread has finished, it will pick up another task, and so on and so on. So we had a problem on the wire, and now we, we have discovered that we also have a limitation on the server. Uh, so what you can see is that after some time, because with HTTP 2 you can go uh, much uh, further than with HTTP 1, we see again a, a, a plateau. And we want to know if there is um, another uh, type of architecture that could make better use of the protocol. So uh, it's time for me to introduce you to the, the Vertex Toolkit. Who knows about it here already? OK, cool, like a third of you. OK, used it uh, in, uh, in home or production? OK, home. So Vertex, it's a, it's a toolkit for building reactive and polyglot applications for the JVM, OK? No, it's a bit fast. So let's uh, look at this in more in details. So a toolkit, because it's embeddable, it's not a server that you download uh, uh, from the web and then install on your machines. It's just a library. So you go to your uh, Maven POM or Gradle build file uh, and, uh, and add the dependency, and that's it. It's composable. It means that we maintain a stack of modules to do different things. You can have HTTP clients, HTTP servers. You have uh, uh, Kafka clients, uh, database clients, etc. But you you uh, really pick the modules that you want, and you, uh, it doesn't cope with a full stack. Um, the dependencies are really minimal. The Vertex Core uh, uh, library is just. Uh, um, Netty plus uh, plus Jackson for the for the JSON, and we try to avoid as much as possible uh, class loading, so we don't do like uh, uh, multiple versions of jars, uh, etc. In your deployment, you create the application. Everything is the same class loader, so it's much easier. And um, I've written injection free here. It doesn't mean that you cannot do a dependency injection uh, with uh, Vertex. It just means that if you want to do dependency injection, you can use dependency in injection tools. But if you want to do you know, plain whole uh, object-oriented design, then it's, it's just fine. It's polyglot. So we have um, uh, bindings for all of these languages. But it's polyglot on the JVM. That means that we have JavaScript for Nashorn, Groovy for Groovy. Uh, Ruby through uh, JRuby, etc., Scala, Ceylon, and um, even more recently, Kotlin. It's reactive, so we have um, uh, only uh, non-blocking APIs in the in Vertex, and it's event-driven. We don't uh, wait. We we. It means that you are going to be notified whenever something happens. So it's not you who calls something; we call you when something is ready. Okay? Uh, it's distributed um, by nature, so. We have uh, something um, called the event bus, which will be, uh, will come to uh, uh, um, in a few seconds. Uh, and that allows you to put your uh, vertex code on different, uh, on different machines, uh, and even down to the browser. You can connect the browser and have the event bus model uh, embedded into the browser. Um, we have RxC file APIs. That means that. Um, who here uses RxJava or knows RxJava? OK, a few people. So we have, um, as we have uh, uh, binding languages, we also have uh, an API for RxJava, where instead of uh, having callbacks, you can just say, uh, for example, Rx bind this HTTP server. And instead of having a callback, you'll get uh, a completable or, or a single or an observable, something like that. So that's pretty cool. And uh, it's Reactive Streams compliant. So uh, we deal with back pressure and so on. But I'm not going to talk about that too much because it's out of the topic. Uh, HTTP2 with Vertex, we, um, we have um, HTTP2 in the client, in the server. We can do uh, HTTP2 on a secure connection, on clear connection. Um, we do everything uh, on the request and response API. We also have um, uh, implemented uh, specific uh, uh, extensions like HTTP uh, to push, which is not to be confused with uh, push like on a WebSocket, etc. because I often get the question, uh, it's not the same thing. Uh, HTTP to push is just a way to tell the browser that uh, he could ask for a resource later. 
but it's not push like uh, this is JSON I want uh, to give you uh, for your application, right? Uh, even driven, the kind of events you, you will receive is like um, uh, if you uh, requested to get a file, you will, you will be notified when a buffer was, uh, was loaded from the disk. Um, if you create timers, you will be notified, of course, when the timer uh, uh, um, um, uh, times out. And uh, you will be notified when you have messages on the event bus. Or if you interact with a database, you will be notified when you have rows which are loaded, etc. Um, the, the model that uh, uh, Vertex uses is the reactor pattern. And this is really important. It's no longer thread pools. Uh, it's the uh, event loop model. So it's just a single thread with different events. And uh, this thread will pick up the different events one after the other. Uh, but this has to go very fast. You don't want to, to, uh, to block this, uh, this, uh, this event loop. You, you pick an event, you do something very, very quickly with it, and go to the, to the second one. So very different from the thread pool model. Uh, who here knows about Node.js? But basically, it's the, yeah, pretty much everybody. <laughs> so it's basically the exact same model, but on the JVM. Um, this is pretty uh, obscure, I think. So I will do a very little um, uh, demo if we have time. Yeah, I think we have. So can you see um, even in the back, or should I go bigger with the? Uh, no, it's okay. Bigger? No. Okay. So here I have a little um, project in IntelliJ. Uh, what I have to do in my POM first uh, is to uh, ask for the uh, Java 8 uh, compiler um, because uh, Vertex does not compile uh, under that. We use uh, lambdas a lot uh, for the callbacks and so on. So we could have done something with um, uh, anonymous classes and whatnot, but it's really a pain. So it's Java 8 minimum. And this is how you get vertex inside your project. You had the dependency. You request that vertex core uh, is included. And finally, <coughs> so 3.5 is the latest version. If all goes well, I should be able to see uh, Here, um, so you can see that the dependencies oh come on uh, what's going on with you is the Wi-Fi connected yes Oh yeah, okay. I have them now. Okay. Um, so as I said, we have uh, dependencies on, on Netty because we don't do the low-level uh, networking and uh, handling ourselves. Then you have Vertex Core, and then you have uh, Jackson because JSON is the is the is the idiom that we use uh, pretty much everywhere inside Vertex. So that's it. We have Vertex uh, ready in our application. Here it's some code which is very similar to uh, what we had in the benchmark. So the first thing you do is you create a Vertex instance like this. Then you create an HTTP server. And if you want for something to happen, you have to define a request handler on your server, which will take an HTTP request. And what we do here is that we say that after 500 milliseconds, we are going to grab the response object from the request and just say hello from backend. Okay? So let's try that. Ah, yeah. That's my demo from the, for the browser. Sorry. Okay, should be, should be fine now. Okay, it started. 
and if I go back here, and send the query, after some time, I see the hello from backend, right? Then I have my um, client. And my client looks like this. It's very simple again. I create my uh, Vertex instance. From this Vertex, uh, 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 then I will create an HTTP client from, uh, from this uh, Vertex instance. But notice here that I want to force the HTTP, HTTP2 uh, protocol version from the client. So basically the client is not allowed to try to negotiate anything if it will try HTTP2 and if it doesn't work it fails, okay? Um, and then what I do here is that I ask uh, Vertex to periodically send a request to, uh, to, the, to the server, the intermediate server, and for that, I will ask the HTTP client to send a request on localhost, on the root path. We could put just anything because as you will see, our backend takes any request and just replies. So it can be anything. And then when we get the response, we'll get the, 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 the body as, as, a, as a buffer and just print out uh, what has been received, okay? So what we are going to do now is to code the intermediate server. We have the backend, we have the client, we have to code the uh, intermediate server. So I have a server. As we saw earlier, we can, we have to set a request handler. So here I'm going to use this function which will get a request and I have to do something with this request which is call the backend, okay? At this point, even if the, the function is not uh, already implemented, I have to tell the server to listen on some port, otherwise nothing will happen at all, okay? Then I also have an HTTP client here. And since I'm uh, a bit worried that something doesn't work, I will shamelessly just copy this from the client. And whenever I get a request from the client on the server, I will use the HTTP client I've just created and send it this time to 8080, which is my backend port. And what should I do here? What I want to do is that when I get the response, instead of printing, printing it on the console, I have to grab the initial request and grab the response object and then just send the buffer to the client, okay? So it's just a proxy, okay? And as you can notice, there is nothing particular here. I've not said that I'm doing an HTTP2 server uh, nor anything. It's, it, just, it just works. So let's try that. I will start my uh, server. Hopefully it will work well. Okay, so it's, uh, it's ready. And let's try now on port 8081. And I get the yellow from the back end. Okay? So what, what you can see from that, it's very easy to write some, um, some applications which are intermediary, intermediaries. So that's one of the biggest use cases for, for Vertex. People use it for, to write uh, API gateways or, or edge services for microservices architecture. Um, uh, so it, it's very easy to write that kind of uh, application uh, with, uh, with that model. But let's go back to our benchmark. Uh, we have been... <coughs> back, but <laughs> way too back. <laughs> okay. Um, 
the benefit of the of this event loop model uh, for HTTP2, and well, in, in general, is that it's um, it's um, simple to to reason about because since you have only one thread instead of many threads uh, uh, for the same code, you can um, um, you have a simple concurrency model, so you get. Um, rid of you know all these concurrency bugs which are very uh, difficult to debug uh, um, and it's also uh, sympathetic with uh, with uh, the mechanics of your machine because basically the it's easier for the processor to get more things um, executed at once uh, because the, the the processor doesn't have to um, you know um, it, it can do a lot of um, optimizations because uh, it's since it's the same thread, the, there are no branch mispredictions and things like that, which are uh, very costly. So that's why it's uh, much more uh, faster. The event loop uh, concurrency model here with HTTP2. This time, the event loop what it can um, really um, profit from the HTTP2 protocol. So whenever you get uh, you get a request from the client. Then the event loop will handle the event and send the request right away to the backend. So the the the, the model is, fits very much uh, with the HTTP/2 uh, uh, connection model. And now, if you compare what you can do with uh, HTTP/2 uh, with a thread pool uh, server, uh, so Tomcat, Spring, uh, Whitefly, uh, etc., or with HTTP/2 non-blocking with an event loop model. You can see you can go much further with just one thread, but it's not. Uh, it doesn't stop there because, um, unlike Node.js, Vertex has the multi-reactor pattern. Uh, that means that if you start Node.js, um, then and, and in, on, on modern architectures you have uh, different CPUs and even different cores on these CPUs, and you are going to use just one of them. With the multi-reactor pattern, with the same process, you can start multiple threads, multiple event loops. And what Vertex will do is to instantiate your code multiple times and make use of all the calls. Okay? And if you do that, then you can go even much further. With, it's the same hardware. And uh, as you can see, we were blocked at uh, 400 with the uh, um, uh, blocking uh, and HTTP, two, uh, HTTP 1 in the beginning. And now we are like uh, at uh, 11,000 requests uh, per second, which is much better. It's the same backend, it's the exact same uh, backend, which reacts the same way. But your server, the intermediate server, is completely uh, coded differently. Um, one thing which is important when you create um, uh, servers with um, with um, uh, Vertex is that you can do, well, you can interact with uh, many things that you probably use today in your projects. Uh, we call that the reactive ecosystem. So we have uh, uh, other, either modules that we maintain ourselves, uh, which we call the, the Vertex stack. Uh, and then the community is very vibrant. Um, there are only four people at, at Red Hat uh, contributing full time to Vertex, but uh, many of these modules are maintained by uh, people who use Vertex in production and who maintain the different modules themselves. Uh, so to conclude, I hope we can have uh, time for a few questions. Yes, um, if you want to make the most out of the HTTP2 uh, protocol on the server, um, you have to uh, use a, a threading model which, is, uh, f which fits very well the, the new uh, uh, concurrency. Um, so the traditional way of architecting applications with, uh, with uh, thread pools, um, we have seen that it's, not, um, it's, it's performing, but it's not as well as what you can get from the same hardware with an unblocking and uh, event loop uh, model. Uh, so Vertex is a great fit for HTTP2, I, I guess you've understood. I encourage you to try. And um, now it's time for questions, if you have uh, any. Yeah? Um, so uh, what, ha what happens when you, because at some point, uh, there will be uh, sessions will be uh, blocking, like for instance, you have to make a, uh, a query to the uh, database. Yeah, okay. Yes. Absolutely, that's a very good Yeah. Is, uh, but, uh, most of them are, are blocking, so 
Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so uh, th that's a very good question, thank you. So uh, we have two, uh, two ways to connect to a database. If you're using uh, MySQL or Postgres, we have a non-blocking driver. So the, the, the protocol is re really implemented. Uh, it's, it's not using GDBC at all, so it's purely reactive. Uh, but of course, it's not only Postgres and MySQL out there. There are a lot of uh, other databases which are well known and well used not any names here <laughs> okay so you only have gdbc and what we do for that is we have a worker pool so if you think about it when you do so uh, no gs you have no choice but non-blocking we vert in vertex we recognize that um, we have designed over the years in the java community many many libraries not not only open source but only those that uh, you in your companies uh, uh, write every day so if you do that, you, you can use a construct which is named uh, execute blocking. And then what happens is that that portion of the code, Vertex will offload it to a worker pool. And then you also specify a callback. And this callback will be uh, invoked when the, the worker has finished. And since it's, it would be inconvenient to do that yourself when you, when you interact with a database, we have a, a GDBC client, which hides everything from you. And when you interact with it, it's like uh, any non-blocking, event-driven thing. But of course, yeah, it's hidden for you. But it, there's still, for these blocking libraries, a worker pool somewhere. Um, well, gRPC, it's a protocol. So I, I would say more how do you compare gRPC with HTTP2 than with Vertex. And actually, with Vertex, you can do gRPC as well. So HTTP, it's a message-oriented protocol, basically. Uh, it's not message uh, a messaging system like a queue, etc. But you send a message, and you get a message in response. GRPC is, uh, as the name says, it's a RPC, but on top of HTTP2, and it just makes use of the, the benefits of the concurrency and so on. So, what has Vertex? Why would it be better to do it with Vertex? That the, the thing is that we we the, we have a gRPC module, and it, and it integrates very well with uh, with our. Uh, um, uh, over libraries, uh, and we also are working on um, an RXified version uh, of it, so you can get, you know, like observable of your uh, gRPC uh, re request, etc. Basically, yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. I will be around if you have uh, any questions, and I have some stickers if you're interested. Uh, so, thank you for joining, and uh, <laughs> thank you. Bye.